Hi everyone, can you hear me? Yeah, good morning. Hi, how are you? I almost had a question. Sure, go ahead. So last class we talked about the walk and finding all, all these different things of market value, book value, of equity. Um, for the ROIC long term that you want us to get for the assignment, we have to yeah, first. As I said, to, uh, I said that uh, we'll get to that. We'll see, we'll learn it uh, probably in the next session. Maybe I will so today. We can't, we, so we can't complete the assignment, you're saying? That's fine. You can just you'll go back to that. Remember, all those assignments will help you to fi finish the final assignment. Okay. So you go back and you just plug it when you know. I can tell you the answer. It's really just to use the. The walk. The walk. But, what the walk no, is supposed you know, to be. The walk. But in order to get the walk, we needed some information. I guess we can. Well, we haven't got that exactly right. You got it. Right. So for now, just like I will use the walk and uh, later on I will finish up. So just make up a walk, make up a walk in the meantime? No, you just can say, you can say I will complete it next. That's fine. That's okay. That's Seth, fine. you got that? Mm -hmm. okay. By the way, I was going back and forth over the years when I was teaching this course, which part I should teach first. The growth, how I see, or should I teach, teach the work? And finally, I ended up the way I'm teaching it now. Because uh, uh, they're related topics, and you don't really know which one to start with. But um, to answer your question, you can just say, I will complete later, that's fine. Okay? Later on, if you see, I just uploaded, I was asked by students, and I think it was a good idea to post the next. Uh, Two assignments, one will be really calculating the work, and the last one is really the final assignment. So I uh, put it in the website, okay? And the final one is really just collecting all your assignments and turn it to a paper, and I gave you an outline how the paper is supposed to look like, okay? So look at that. If you have questions, please just shoot me an email. I will clarify if there's something. Wait, so, clear. So, so for two things, one is, um, um, so Alex might have already asked this. Um, yeah, so so RIC long term is 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 the same thing as walk. It's a um, to, and I will give the rationale as we talk about it. That's right, maybe you know, the next so later on why that exactly happens. Um, In fact, I, I touched on that last time, but we didn't. We don't really know the walk, so you can't really use it. You know, the reason we said if the RIC would be higher than the walk. That means this company is going to be after 100 years or something like that will be extremely valuable, almost will take over the whole economy. Okay. Oh, okay. And um, but we talked about all of that. We'll get to we'll get to that again toward next session. But I kind of mentioned it a little bit last time. Right. So like we were we we tried figuring out okay if we know that ROIC long term should equal walk how can we find walk and then we said okay we have all the variables we need for walk the only thing that we couldn't find in the in the database on the website was um was RD now I know that we could have just you can so use the, that's the topic of today by the way that's exactly the uh, topic okay. of today said, okay we're going to talk RD. about uh, how to find the the cost of death which is interest rate or RD and then right. we're going to talk about cost of equity and then we combine the two and we get to the work. After okay. we have the work we can do the net present value and then the third step which is really doing some adjustment and then we're done. So the next couple of weeks will be down with the DCF and almost everything we need to. And, and then we'll touch on another topic which is extremely important. Um, I added it to this course just because I know how important it is, which is uh, merger and acquisitions. And I will show uh, two, special, uh, two special accounts that you will need for your paper. And uh, I have already a recording, so you can go ahead and look at it from previous years. And I will just go over it, okay? Is, is the paper gonna be that, um, like I know we're doing all these assignments throughout the semester. Is it is it a paper just really just um, combining everything or do we need to then write up a piece of paper on everything that we all these uh, assignments you really do have to reorganize it like to look like a paper and this the last assignment I put the outline okay and usually okay. people don't really have a problem doing it for so many years now uh, 
you, the hard work you already have done, you studied the material. And that's the beauty about those assignments. It's help you to split your learning and uh, the work over the semester, not work for the end of the semester. Okay, but for now, the assignment we don't need, if, because we can't find long-term ROIC, which also means you can't find the long-term reinvestment rate. Correct. So it means that's what we're going to do today. We'll okay. start with it. Hopefully we'll finish most of it today and we'll do some next week. Okay. Uh, so as I said, in fact, I think I, I might have written it on the assignment itself that you really don't know what it is now, but we will get to that and then you can fill it up. Okay, wonderful. So should we start or we wait another minute or two? I think uh, we have quite a lot. So I will start and people can watch the video if they're missing something. What we're gonna to do today, first of all, uh, let me close this one, I will open the courses, and we go back to this one. I'm going to close the video just to have the connection would be better since this corona started uh, unfortunately it, uh, it's harder the communication is a little harder but i will leave definitely okay good so this is our uh, 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 course uh, material and we are in cost of capital last time we in the introduction we saw the importance of it and we went over a real example similar to what I used to give in exams previous years, okay? And here you have the solution, and you can play with the numbers, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Then uh, we kind of, to remind you, this is something we have done in previous sessions, uh, and uh, uh, just to remind you how the discounted cash flow going to be. So, so far we finished uh, the growth rate we talked, we talked about the terminal value, we talked about the importance of the work, but we didn't really talk about how do we actually calculate it. And that's the topic of today. So we can really actually calculate that one. And that's what we're gonna to do today. By the way, I added here the readings, please. The book, let me say that, I think it's the best book I, I know of in this uh, topic, but it's a little uh, harder for some people for introductory level. So if you get some topics that are too hard, don't feel bad because I'm not going to ask about it. But it's a really good enrichment. If you can handle it, it's good for you. But I'm going to ask in the exam all this stuff that I cover in class. I do recommend it, for example, chapter 13. It's not an easy chapter, okay? Or the other chapters that I recommend. So and there are sometimes they use a lot of those equations, and I really don't ask you to remember them. You only need to know the equations that I provided you during the semester, okay? So it's an excellent book, but it's a little above the level that I require. And I used to recommend other books. I found so many errors in them and I stopped recommending them. So this is really the one that I would stick. And if somebody wants to go into this topic and or make a career, that's definitely an excellent book to try to job. You might run into it when you do your master's degree. You probably will run into somebody, whoever you're taking the course with, recommending this book. Very common book, an excellent book. I'm but a can, and also have enough theory uh, to follow with it. To Amos, about the exam. Ahead. Amos? Yes? Um, just right because IDC mentioned right. And I know you said the, the exam is still the the same kind of exam, um, even though we're doing it online, um, which IDC announced. Um, is it is it open notes because we're doing it from home? What's the what do we? See, I never about? gave it open note, okay. And mm. from my experience, and for my even not with a cheat uh, sheet or something like that or formula sheet or, right. and take my word for it, it's worked so well for the last 12 years. I need to reconsider because of the corona stuff. So uh -huh. let me think about it. I don't think it should make a difference, but if I feel so, I will uh, do so. 
Okay, secondly, if you need a formula, a specific one, then I don't think you should memorize it by heart, I would put it in the question, okay? And I'm gonna dedicate at least the last session preparing you for the exam. Pay attention to the why phrase that I really prepare you for the exam so you won't be surprised on something you get to the exam and you see something you haven't seen before, okay? Mm -hmm. It's not a review session, it is preparation for the exam. So you won't get into this problem. But let me think about it because I never have been in a situation that you do, you know, online Just exam. Question, like um, uh, like uh, equation oriented, or are they more like, um, I don't know, like understanding, you know, like where certain things come from on the balance sheet. Like I know like we spoke about like breaking down the um, cash flows, right? Like saying, um, you know, questions like that, I guess. Exactly. See, my style of questions are two types. One is I can give you, let's say, this one, I can give you a screen like this one, mm. and I will erase some numbers. I'll plug numbers here, and I'll make you fill it up. So I know you understand how it's better. So that could be a style of a question. And you saw we have many of those. We, we didn't have many, but we have enough the, to ask questions, okay? The second question is some a little bit discussions. I will give an example today, okay? And for the exam, I will also upload several styles of questions that I usually ask. So I don't really want to get to that now, but take my word for it, you will be well prepared for the exam. And uh, I dedicate, as I said, at least the last session to actually prepare you. You will see my style of questions, the type of questions, so you don't really have to worry about it. And by the way, this is a question that we did last time. This is exam question, okay? And if you notice, I try even to put it really step by step, just to know that you really understand the structure on the meaning of what creates value. This is a nice style of a questions. This is usually a 30 points question. It's a heavy questions, okay? Secondly, I might ask you, and I gave some examples in the take a test but I will give you more examples. I will be starting giving you, because we're getting, you know, we just passed the half of the semester. I will start putting similar questions from the exam in the take a test. So you have a good experience, okay? Um, and then um, something that, I, I don't know if you want to add it to the website, but like when we were doing the assignment this past week, um, when we were looking uh, through, because like our company is is Apple, so we were looking um, at how you know valuation and the data and whatever, um, and there there's a lot of things that um, like it'll say like um, you know I don't know like ROIC is this right given all these things. So I I, I know that like part of the assignment is like figuring out how to do ROIC. Um, but like for some I'm of the saying, things- let's, let's take your company. This is exactly, that's why I did this simulation. And the last thing is when you ask, we actually, you know, take that example and use it. This is the company you're doing, is that right? Yeah. Good. Okay, and we are in the United States. We're gonna talk about this assumption, United States. Okay, and I'm gonna do evaluation for 2019 because that's the last by the way you are missing data this is something that a lot of you probably have run into it okay you get infinity here you're stuck you don't know what to do and i'm going to demonstrate it today okay uh, you're probably missing data some of the companies for some reason don't report the interest expense as interest expense they embed it inside this data come from the sec as a as a, as a XBRL format. I didn't want to go into that. So when I put in the data from the SEC, they might don't report it in the way it should be. So what you really need to do is plug the number here. Let me use another company, okay? Uh, I'm gonna keep this one, and I'm gonna use another company that I'm gonna use for today's session. Okay, let me use uh, 3M, one of my favorite company, by the way. I really love this company. I think they're doing extremely well. And they probably will do well because they're being run very well, okay? United States. Now, this company, for example, 
okay? Also didn't have interest expenses. I plugged it in. That's why it is. if you go into data, okay, and you go into the interest expense, this is a good one and I'm glad you mentioned. If you notice, you see this number? It wasn't there. I just plugged it in before the session today because I know a lot of you are running into this problem and then you get stuck and you don't know what to do. How did I got that number? You see, they didn't even report these ones. They probably have done some change in the last three years. So in order to get my valuation right, I need this number, okay? Because interest coverage rate ratio, something we're gonna to cover today, you will need. So one of the things I'm gonna to mention today, you need this number. How do I get it? I get it from the financial statements, and I'm gonna show it today. And basically it's this minus this, but this is one of the topics of today, okay? The same things you need to do, as I will show today how I got that number, let me put it as a zero for now, okay? That's what it was before I did the change. If I go back, you'll say I'll get the same error as you did, okay? Okay, I get the same error as you did. You see that? Yeah, yeah. Okay, and now don't worry about it. You just really have to fill up this number. You fill this number, you'll be okay. I will show it today, okay? So let me okay. leave those two, and then we'll come back to that and we'll see how it's okay. linked to what we said. So I was just gonna say, like, if you go to like valuation. No, um, hold it. You can't really move on because you really got stuck. You're missing a very important component. No, I know, but I was just gonna say, like, it, it might be like a cool aspect. Um, like if yeah, you, you get a lot of missing, you know, and no, right. like if, if, um, like if you, if you were to scroll down, like if, if you were to click on like one of those things, it kind of shows you, okay, where where does that calculation come from exactly? I'm not following. Sorry. So, so a lot of these things. Um, I mean, I don't know right now, but like, um, so this one we went over our last session, these two, we covered all of those, those two and you have it in the recording. This one, it's a topic of today. This one and this one, it's a topic of today. So why don't we wait and then we sum up okay. the whole things. Okay. Okay. And then you will see because those two we covered last time. Okay. Today, I want to cover those two, and then we can really move on to the valuation. We're not ready to move to this one yet. We're still here on cost of debt, cost of equity, and then we'll go to valuation, and we'll see how the work is being calculated. So bear with me, okay? I promise I will come back and give you a complete answer. And I just wanted to highlight, so if somebody, of, some of you are getting an infinity here, don't get scared. It just has to do with, Several companies, in fact, a lot of companies, don't report interest in the conventional way in the XBRL. So that's something that I think the SEC even they try to remove it. They can choose their own title. When they choose the different title, then you, this title just gets zero and then you can really do the calculation. So the easy way is just to go and find it's the annual report. I'm going to show an example with 3M today. Okay, so let's start. Uh, this one we did last time, and today we're going to really see how do we calculate the work. So there are two components in the work which are very important. One is cost of debt, and one is cost of equity. We start with the cost of debt. And anybody wants to give at least kind of, you know, if I tell you I issued a bond, and the bond was such and such. In fact, I have a good example here. I just prepared here. If you click here, you, I just made up one on Excel. And this one showing you, let's say the company have issued power value 10,000. Let's say it's 10 million. Yeah, let's say the whole numbers is by thousand. So it's 10 million. It doesn't really make a difference. Okay, I issued a, a bond that the power value is 10,000 
and the coupon rate is 5%, okay? And I know that this bus being traded for 9,000, okay? Now, and this, uh, this bus is for 20 years, if I recall. Okay, so if you go and look at that, I have 20 years. What does it really mean? It means when the issue is for 10,000, the promising 5%, so every year you're gonna get 5% of the 10,000. So every year you're gonna get 500. Fair enough, that's what a bonds means. When you're issuing a bonds, you get every year the power coupon rate times the power value, that's what you get every year. At the last period, okay, in the last period, you will get the 500 plus the principal. Pay attention, you're getting the 10,000 in the last period. So if I look at the cash flow that I'm getting from these banks, it's 500 every year. And the last period, I'm getting 10,500. It's the principal plus the 500. Okay, so that's the cash flow from this bond. Now I ask myself, what is the market value of it? I do know because it's being traded. If it is a traded bonds, then I can go like reverse engineering, trying to find the yield. Yield is really what is the actual return that this bonds is giving. Since it's being traded for 9,000, which is less than the power value, the yield it will be always higher than the coupon rate. That's something you should have studied in your course in finance. I hope you did. Okay, anybody? Did you study that? Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. So if I'm giving you, I'm not gonna make you in the exam do it because I'm not gonna repeat what you did in finance. It's more important for me that you be aware that theoretically, if I have a company and they issue only bonds that are traded in the stock exchange, what is my interest rate? The way I calculate it, it's that yield. That yield is the interest rate for that company, okay? So, stage number one, if I see a financial statement and this company has only traded bonds, I can calculate the yield. How do I calculate the yield? It's the interest rate in which the net present value of all those payments will be equal exactly to the market value is being traded. I don't really care about the val power value, and I don't really care exactly what is the power coupon. All what I care is what the yield that bring the net present value of this cash flow to the market value. Of course, I need to know how to calculate what the cash I'm receiving. That depends on those two numbers. No question. Okay. But the bottom line to calculate the interest rate for the work, what I need for the work, this is what I need. That's the yield. Okay, I'm not gonna repeat what you studied in finance. Basically, if you, but by the way, there is, I really strongly recommend, you probably have learned it in, when you studied Excel, uh, in the analysis, in the data you have, I never really use Excel anymore, but there is a what if, or a goal seek. You see there is a goal seek, okay? And the way you do it, you know, you say set cell, set, you're setting this cell, okay, to, uh, sorry, you want to set this one, you want to set this one to a value of 9,000 by changing this cell. And when I built up this Excel, the discount factor, it is a function of this one. For example, 0.9446, it is one over, one plus six percent. And this one is the same thing, just square, etc. I did all of them, I multiply, then I add them up and I got that amount. Let's do that and use different numbers, okay? Let's, for example, if the coupon rate was, just I will make it up, 5.5%. Fair enough? You know, if the coupon rate was, uh, let's, you know what, let's make it, just for the fun of it, let's make 7%, a rounded number. Okay, if I'm paying 7% and 
the market value would be higher than 10,000. But I know it's being traded for 9,000, so that one must be higher than seven. But how do I find it exactly? You can't really solve it analytically. You have to use kind of a simulator. And that's what the, the one in Excel does. I never really use any more Excel. I use a Python, which you run into a loop and you solve it quickly. But for you, this is another bad idea. You're going to gold seek. You try to set this cell to be 9,000. And then by changing this cell, that's on it. And okay, and bingo. He found that it's supposed to be 8%. For this company that issue a bunch of power value of 10,000 and they're giving a coupon of 7% and it's being traded for 9,000, the yield is 8% and this is my interest for calculating the work. That's example number one when you have a company that have traded bonds. Unfortunately, many companies don't have. Ever most of the companies don't really have. And many companies, they might have some traded and most of them are not traded. And then you're getting into a trouble, what am I going to do now? And that's going to take us to the next, uh, the next uh, method. Questions so far for this one. By the way, that's what I said here, look up the yield and how to calculate the yield, you have a nice Excel here. Please go over it, this is really from your finance course and now with the help of this video, you can really do it yourself, very easy, okay? If the company do not have traded bonds, okay, then I go into a different method. And the second method is just saying, okay, how risky is this company, okay? Or how risky is this bonds? So sometimes you might be lucky and some uh, grading agent like Moody, S&P, or one of them, they might put a grading for that company, okay? And based on that grading, you say, you know what? This is riskier than risk-free. So I will add a spread to the risk-free. Um, I will jump a little bit in a second. I'll come back to that again. What I'm going to do is I'm taking the risk-free and I'm adding to it. We haven't talked about what is risk-free and we're going to talk about it in a minute. But whatever the risk-free is, I'm going to add a spread. And the spread I'm going to use, it's based on whatever the grading, those grading companies have given. So you will say, well, if the, my company is double A, not triple A, like a risk for it, how much would be the spread? And there's a lot of agents like uh, Gartner, and there's really even breaking them down by industries. And they tell you if a company is double A, the spread should be 1%, okay? If they are double B, which is extremely, not really that well, then the spread should be two and a half percent. So what you will do is take the two and a half percent and add it to the risk free, that will be your estimations for the bonds spread. Let's, let me write it down, okay? I think I went a little too fast. So if I don't have, a, if the company doesn't have a traded bonds, what I will do, the RD will be equal to the RF plus a spread. How do I calculate the spread? How do I calculate the spread? The spread, it's a function. The spread is a function. How risky is the company? So I need to look it up if there is a grading for this company. And if that company being graded, then I will have to go and look at another table and find out how much I have to add to that company to find the out. Okay? The reason I didn't really show and I'm not going to ask you to do either of those two methods, not because they are not common and not because they are not important. They are extremely important. They are quite common when you have the data. The only reason is they will take you too much time to do it for your own paper. So we're going to use another method, uh, which is very common too, and I will talk about it in, in a minute. A, a third method, before I will get to the one that I want you to use for your paper, it's something called 
a credit default swap. I don't know if you took a, a course in options, but usually credit default swap, it's a kind of option. I will just make it short. It means that you can go and buy insurance on buying a specific bonds of a company. Let me say it again. Let's say a IBM have issued bonds for such and such, okay? And IBM is, uh, you know, they, they have some risk and I want to estimate how much should be the spread on the bonds of IBM. And I don't really know how risky it's IBM. So I look it up at the options trading and there is the CDS traded on the bonds of IBM. What does that mean? That means that that option is kind of an insurance. If IBM will default, you're gonna get the money from whoever sold you the CDS. So the cost of the CDS is the spread. So it's like I'm buying insurance to make IBM as a risk-free. So that is a replacement for the spread. Okay, is that clear? Anybody? No? Yes, that's yes. clear. Is that clear? Yeah. Good. So we have several ways to really estimate the yield or the RD. One is the yield to maturity, which is when it's traded, say, bonds, when the bonds are not traded, but you still have rating for the company. I can use the spread according to the rating. Or a third one is just look at options that mimic the risk of those bonds. Okay, so I gave an example of IBM. So the spread will be exactly the cost of the CDS because the CDS is really turning the IBM stock to be risk free. Okay, those are common method. Uh, I'm not gonna ask you to do it for the, your paper because that would really take a lot of time and search. Real life, be aware. I might ask a question of describing what is the CDS and what we can use it for. That could be a question in the exam, okay? So I do expect you to know the existence of those questions, but I'm not gonna make you do it. It just takes too much work. The third one, which I already have done automatically in the valuation, in the simulation, it's called synthetic rating. What does that really mean? Okay, let's say, I have a company, which is a lot of companies. I don't have traded bonds, or I have only partial or really small part of the bonds of the company traded, or I don't have a rating for the company. You know, it's only really the top 100, or maybe 200 they have rating, but most of the other ones don't really have a rating. So, or they don't have a CDS, okay? Uh, so you end up and many times you do evaluation for a company that don't have either one of those three. Then you do a, something which is known as synthetic rating. And let me describe it by looking at an example. Let me go to, uh, let's look, take, uh, no, since I prepared already this one and Apple will dig in in a minute, but I need to use what it's known as an interest coverage ratio. What does that mean? Interest coverage ratio, okay? It is the ratio of the interest relative to the EBIT. So if I take the EBIT, divide by the interest expense, that's what is known as interest coverage or interest coverage ratio. It's the EBIT divided by the interest. What's the logic? Because you know from the EBIT, the first things you need to pay is the interest. So you don't pay any taxes before you pay interest. You don't pay any dividend before you pay the interest. They are first in line. So all this amount is available to pay interest. So that ratio is a very meaningful. I'm getting infinity just because I'm, I have a missing data. It's already that it's a, it's a, it's a infinity. I looked at the data and I look at the interest expense I have data here, but the last year, which is the most important, I don't have any data. So what did I do? I went online and I downloaded the annual report of 3M. I looked it up and I looked at the supplemental income statement information, and here we go. By the way, if you look at the financial statement, you won't find that line there, it's only in the notes. 
which is really interesting. Many times you won't really find the numbers. You expect it to be in the income statement, but it really isn't. It's all in the note. So I went to the note, I looked at the interest expense, and I see there is also interest income. I just took the difference. By the way, it's in millions. So the difference is 360, uh, how much is that? Six, uh, 32, is that right? Am I right or I'm wrong? No. 368, yeah. So let's plug the number here. Amos, uh, in yeah. this one, if it says, um, if you go back to this, like back to the- In a minute, I'm coming, yeah. going back. There was me, I just plugged the number here. I'm going back. Go ahead. If it says interest expense and it's 448, it's positive. And interest income, if it's in brackets, is it not negative? It's a negative, it means- Expense is a negative, well, it really so means, you would add them. Yeah, yeah, but see, it's negative because it's an income. So it's really yeah. kind of writing what is the expenses. So this is expense, this is income, so I took the difference. That's what, oh, okay. You got it? Yeah. It's a good question, by the way. You know, honestly, it takes many years to really know how to read and how to find those information. You will never guess that you wouldn't find interest expense in the income statement. Yeah, I would have deducted it if it was without the brackets because income is a positive number and expense is a negative exactly, number. Exactly, but it depends on what the, the purpose of the schedule. Yeah. Here it's yeah. coming to show you the expenses. So income is a negative as an expense. You got it? Good, yeah. Okay, good. So I just subtracted, it came up to be 368. And now I have this number. Now, if I go back to the calculation, still in fact, I have to really refresh the screen. Okay, I, I probably need to avoid it and do something that you don't really have to. I take so much work to. So I'll go back to 3M and here we go. And now my data is updated, so I should be okay. By the way, it's only once, it's keep it on the server. So from now on, I don't really have to touch it. So it will be right there. And I should be all okay. Thomas, what if, Thomas, what if the interest income is greater than interest expense? Then it, you, would, you don't really have interest expense. Did I uh, screw up here? Hold a second. No, for some reason, it didn't take my number here. Let me put it again. Sorry about it. Thomas. Oh, one second, that was me. I just want to make sure I plug the number right. I think I didn't click OK last time. Now I'll refresh it. I'll come back to you in a minute. I apologize. Let me just focus. I will do all companies. Go here, 3M, and bingo. Now it should be fine. That choose United, and that should be United States. And now I'm okay. Okay? Now I'm okay because he's taking really the ratio. See this number, you see the 368 just came from here. The place that I just plugged the number that I was missing. I was missing this number. So that's why I got infinity. Because I got the EBIT divided by that number. The EBIT is this number. So this is the EBIT and this is the interest expense. So he's taking those two numbers right to here and he's dividing this by this one. When it was zero, I got infinity and he can't really do it. So when I do this one divided by this, I got interest coverage of 16.78. Let me just finish this part and I'll get back to your question, okay? So if I'm getting this high number, okay, this is really a good rated company. And how do you really know that, in fact, what I put here in the, in the screen, this is really the table that's in the database. He pulled it automatically. He found that really this company is 16.67. It's between 8.5, and it's above 8.5, it's a very good company. That means I'm making a lot of profit relative to the interest. I'm making more than eight times. That means that I'm most likely gonna pay my interest. So this is really quite secure company, okay? Or oh, it's extremely well, so the spread is very, very small, 0.4. On oh, that, so that's oh, Why are you looking at 8.5? Say again? Sorry, why are you looking at 8.5? Oh, I'm saying that inside the simulator, this simulator 
got you 16.7 based on the financial statement. Is that right? That's what we took the, from the financial statement. That came, the EBIT came right from here. This is the EBIT. Here we go. This is the EBIT. You see that number? And the interest expense, it's right this number. So this one divided by this one give you 16.78. Okay, but what does that mean? How good is this company that has such a ratio? And that's for that you need another table. The table is um, already embedded in the simulation. I'm just showing it to you here. This is in fact the table that I use in the simulation. So if a company has a ratio, see this is the ratio. If it's higher this number, higher than 8.5, it means it's a very good company and the spread is really minimal, 0.4. But on the other hand, if I got, uh, let's use another one, you know what? It is another company. Uh, it's for the fun of it, why not? That's a good one, because this is really a company in trouble. Okay, so let's use another company. How about the Ford? What do you say? Let's use Ford. Okay, Ford, my, which ones do I have here? Yeah, here we go. Fair enough? Okay, I'm gonna pull the country, US. And let's look at their ratio. Wow, their interest coverage ratio is so low. It's 0.11. That means their EBIT, it's barely covering 10% of their interest. That company is a bad situation. They will have to raise money. That company should be closed down. You know, and we'll see. Their rating, it's D2 to D. How did I got that rating? Okay, let's go back to this table. And I got 0.11. It's really in the lower rate. If you see that, it's below 0.2. Is that right? So it's really below 0.19. It's 0.11. So that's why they are being graded at D2D. And that's really what you're seeing here is being graded as D2D. It's according to the table I just showed you right in here. Fair enough, does that make sense? So this yes, table, thank you. Uh, let's take another example. You know, I just got two extreme cases. Let's take another one. Okay, let's use another company. Which company you got? Let's do, how about, Netflix, my favorite. I'm going to ask a question, maybe? Yeah, one second. I'm going to give you a question. Don't worry. I promised before. I just wanted to make sure that I cover this stuff. I take Netflix, okay? Netflix, United States. And just to clarify how that one works, okay? The interest coverage ratio of Netflix is 4.16. You take the EBIT, divide by interest expense, you get 4.16. So how did I got this rating A3, A minus? Let's go back again to the table, the table here. So 4.16, it's in this range between those two, between three to 4.2, is that right? So that's why the rating is A3, A, and I need to add 1.3% as a spread because of the riskiness of Netflix. So if I look at Netflix, okay, the interest covered ratio is 4.16. That's the rating. According to the table, I should add as a spread 1.3 to that one. Okay, now questions, go ahead. Hello? Anybody? Did I lose yeah, you? What company has uh, for example, I just looked at Apple, they have interest and dividend income, and then they have interest expense. And the interest- What I care here is only interest, because I can't really distribute any dividend before no, I can really pay no, interest. So what do you do? You just ignore, if it says interest and dividend income, you ignore it? The dividend is irrelevant in this state. No, it's called in one category, interest and ah, dividend. Ah, that's a problem. That yeah. really is, you're absolutely right. That's really the hard part of financial stand. This is why you can really appreciate how valuable is this table? Because yeah. if you had to build it up yourself, protect it forever, that's what happened until I got this simulation online. Uh, I felt very sorry for the student, honestly. And I tried to help as much as I could. But this one really solved you a lot of problems. Still, 
No, but there is I say, a category that says interest expense. Exactly. There is you would have to go, as I did here, I went to the annual there's, report. There's also interest income. There's also interest income. Yeah, I went here almost, and there's something called interest expense. Then the column that you see there, interest income, it's called interest income and dividend uh, income. So you know what? In that case, I would say the hair was the second one. I would just use the first one because most likely it won't make a difference. So even for a, a, even for a 3M, if I use the 44A, it won't change my conclusion. Which company is this one? This is 3M. Let's go for 3M. If I change that one to be instead of 368 and I put here 448, it won't make a difference. You know, it's true. Let me refresh it. And do it re over, do it, do it again. 3M. And you will see it won't make a difference. Because the ratio is usually, or is it really, if you see it didn't really, it changes by slightly, you know, for 16 or 13. It's still the best, you know, the best rating. So it didn't really change the result. So this is detailed. I wouldn't bother with that too much. So if you got income plus dividend, the hell was it? Put it aside, just use the first row. Okay? And write a note in your paper. Okay? Good? Hello? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good one. Okay, good. Now we know how to kind of, I'm ignoring for now what is that says estimate country default spread. I will talk about it in a second. Okay, in a minute, I'll talk about this one as well. For now, it's... Amos, this... Go ahead. Sorry, can I ask a quick question? Sure. Is the spread what we're using for cost of debt? This is the spread for 3M, 0.0%. It's really almost nothing. So I'm adding to the 2%, the risk-free, the, to the 0.4. So my estimate of RD, what we always call RD, it's 2.4. Okay. Okay. There's one more topic. Okay. I, uh, you know, one more topic. See, we used here United States. The truth of the matter, I didn't want to get this simulation too complicated, but I do really want you to know about it. It's very important. Let me just choose it. Choose it here. The, uh, so we'll have the other stuff. You know, 3M, most. Most of the time they really do work in the United States, but there's many like Ford. We did Ford before. They, now that was Netflix. This one, which one was that one? Now this is frame again. Let's do Ford again. The truth of the matter, you know, Ford is also not a really, you know what, let's take Netflix, because Netflix is all over the place. Okay, if I use the country to be United States, that's, that's not really reflecting the true risk of the country. You know, if you see here, spread zero, that means United States, when you do business in the United States, you have a really good legal system. Most of the time, you won't get screwed up. And if you do, you have a good system that you can enforce that. But if you do business in Brazil or any other country, just choose another country here. Why do I put here, let's say I do it South Africa, okay? So South Africa, it's much riskier than the United States, okay? So if I really want to estimate the interest rate of doing business in South Africa, it wouldn't be, I would have to add to the 2%, okay? I have interest coverage, that means I have another risk of the company, that's 1.3, 1.3 plus the two, I have to add to that 1.6% because I'm operating in a very risky country like South Africa. Not very risky, but riskier than the United States. So you have, in fact, in the database, I put another one for every country. What is the rating of that country by S&P? In fact, I, I use the S&P. And according to that, what must, should be the spread for that country. So. Let me repeat and conclude. How do we do cost of debt? We take the risk free, then we estimate how much spread we need to add because the company is risky. So Netflix is not the most secured company based on the EBIT 
relative to the interest or the interest coverage. According to the interest coverage ratio, it's a little risky, so I have to add 1.3 percentage. In addition, if Netflix was operating only in South Africa, I should have added another 1.6 percent, okay? And the total RD would be 4.9. Some of you should ask immediately and say, hey, Amos, you are oversimplifying, and I would say you are absolutely right. In fact, this part should really allow me to add several countries and do some weighted average. Netflix operating not only in South Africa, not only in the US, not only in Israel, not only in Europe. And I might, I, know, I might should choose really like a weighted average worldwide. I don't know if I put it here worldwide. Let me check, I might do. Uh, this is uh, North America. So if you take, if they're operating only in North America, that's fine. I don't know if I did worldwide. I don't think I put worldwide, but I probably should add worldwide. Like Netflix would be a good one. If I have a company that work only in Central America, Central and South America, I will use that one as a region. And that will be an average for that region. If I work only in a specific country, if I operate in Zimbabwe, it probably would be like 10%. Most likely you won't get your money back, okay? If I operate in a region, so I put a region, I really should add worldwide because the, so, but if I don't have, I can just use as close as possible. So if I'm working in Western Europe, that's the one I use, but I don't believe it should be Western Europe might be, okay? And how about the Eastern Europe? Let's see, Russian, that's 1.9. I think this is the typo. I have a feeling this probably should be 0.9%. I need to double check that. But I think that those numbers are already taken from the those services. So I just double check. This seems like a little too high, but who knows? Middle East, okay, 7.5. That makes sense. If I go to Israel, if I did business only in Israel, then I will choose Israel, bingo. Israel is 0.7, but quite safe, okay? And the rating of Israel will be a lot of, so you will add whatever it's the spread in this one. Okay, uh, I, I used to make students to calculate that one and then I find out that it's really a waste of time. And you just need to know that when you calculate the cost of debt, you have risk-free, you have the spread for the company riskiness, and then you have a kind of a wider leverage for the other countries it's operating. For your paper, it's enough to use the United States, the country of incorporation. So that's good enough for your paper. But for I real have life, a question. yeah, go ahead. Sure. Um, so just to clarify, if we're doing a multinational company like McDonald's, do we take a weighted average for cost of debt based on the company's business in those countries? Correct. That's in real life. In your paper, I won't, uh, I won't ask that. It's enough that you make a comment and you will for simplification. I am using, uh, since the McDonald's is mostly in the United States, I'm simplifying it and I'm using only the risk of country of the US, which is quite close to risk for you. But in real life, you should do what you just said now. That's a good one. Okay, let's move on. Is that okay? More questions? This is a good time to pause. Questions? Um, yeah, but for the, for the growth rate in the long run, I did do a weighted average. That's okay. That's fine. That's fine. I'm going to get in a minute to the equity. I, I did a little more for the equity. Theoretically, I should have given you here places to put several countries in which you are operating. And then the water leverage of those one will go directly into here. Okay. I just didn't want to make it too complicated, especially not for introductory class. Okay. But you're absolutely right. In fact, if I want to extend these simulations, I'll put here a place. You choose every country you do a business in, and then a water leverage of the spread for each one of those countries based on how much business I do in them. And then the water average will go right into this line instead of just using the United States. Good, more questions, guys? 
Anybody? Can I move on? Does somebody say yes? So I know that I didn't lose the connections. Yeah, you can move on. Okay, thank you. It's like, uh, you know, I can't really charge the internet. So I saw that I don't get a respond. I'm afraid that I might close to you. So I would really appreciate it then if somebody would just say yes, and I know I didn't lose the connections. Thank you. Okay, let's move on. The next one is estimating of cost of equity. By the way, ever since that I'm going over, it's right in here. So ever since that I did, it's right in here. And cost of debt, I talked about it. And uh, by the way, before I move to the equity, sorry about it. What is risk-free? Risk-free, honestly, there's no such a thing. Even countries are risky. You know, if you ask uh, Black and Schultz, those guys that they got a Nobel Prize in economics, they thought that they can do some arbitrage with bonds of government, and to their unfortunate, they went bankrupt because they thought that there's no way that Russia would go bankrupt. In 1992, they did go bankrupt, and they didn't pay on their bonds, and then uh, their company went uh, down. In fact, they have lost $60 billion. The government has to bail them out to some extent. So there's not really such a thing as risk-free, but there is close to risk-free. You know, we tend to believe that America is risk-free. Who knows if it's really true risk-free, but it's as, as, as close as you can get to risk-free, okay? So if I look at the government bonds of the US, I say, okay, this is going to be a good estimate of risk-free. It's how much the yield on government bonds of the US government. And now the question is, well, what length or what the maturity of the bonds should I use? Should I use 10 years government bonds? Should I use 20 years, 30 years? Or should I use T years, which they are less even than a year? What do you think? What's your common sense say? Anybody want to jump in? Go ahead. Anybody? What do you think I should use? Anybody? Ali? Probably more than 10, because the longest president uh, term is more than eight years, or is eight years. I agree with you. In fact, theoretically, since we're doing the discounted cash flow as if the company is going to live forever, the longer the best. So from theoretical point of view, you're absolutely right. I really should use probably the third year. That's mimicking, you know, what my exercise is using net present value of long term for the company. It's true we have a growth period of five years, but then we use golden equation for the infinity. So if I want to use the risk free, I probably should use 30 years. But the problem is now it's really practical, not theory. Practically the volatility of that yield on 30 years government bonds is extremely high. So it's not really a reliable estimate. So people in real life using 10 years government bonds, okay? So it's really on practical matter, not on theoretical matter, that we use in real life 10 years government bonds. Now, if you look at the past, you will see that fluctuating around between one and a half, two and a half, three sometimes. So in the recent years, you will see it's already around 2%, and that's really common to use 2% today as a risk free and they are really the more kind of most of the US government bonds. Well, I won't be surprised it will go down the next few years, who knows? I, mean, I never really remember in my life a period as like the last 10 years that the interest rate went down, was down for so long. I don't think there was another period since whatever that uh, interest rate was so low. Basically the, you know, interbank or whatever the, whatever the central bank is giving to the banks is close to zero. And in the government bonds you get 2%. I never really remember as low as that low for so long. So estimating or using 2% and I told you to use that one also for your paper. In fact, I already put it in embedded in, the, in here. I put it as a 2% as a risk free. So using risk rate 2%, I just put it there for you. And here I just tried to explain why I'm using 2%. In real life, if that changes over the years, maybe jump to 225, 
you just adjust it in the simulation or whatever you do. Okay, good. That's summarizing that part. There are a lot of other topics. It's really for advanced classes, least commitment, R&D, straight versus convertible. But that's I will leave you to graduate school when you come back and you take our course in graduate school. Okay, but I won't ask you in the exam, and that's not required. Okay, neither for your paper. If you're really interested, the book talks about those topics, and you can see it's in your annual report of the company you analyze it. But it's not part of this, the scope of this course. Let's go to the next topic. We're gonna go now to the equity. Let's think about the equity. You have studied, this is my recording from last year, or last, I don't remember when, but I recorded this session, I just modified it slightly. So, and I'm recording it now, so I'll upload the new recording. Uh, cost of equity, you have studied the CAPE model, okay? But if you follow, the, the CAPE model already have changed so many times. Recently, uh, relatively recently, pharma and franchise have modified the model to have even five components, not just one. Okay, we have one here, the, what we call the expected risk premium, and we have the risk free, and we'll multiply the expected risk premium by the beta, and that you studied in your a course in finance, how to estimate the expected return on the equity of a company. So if I have IBM, let's go back to IBM, I want to estimate what is the return on stock of IBM, I will run a regression, I will find the beta, I'll take the beta, I'll multiply it by the risk premium, and add to that the risk free, that should be my estimate to the equity cost of capital. That will be my RE in the work, okay? That's what we learn in finance classes. In real life, it's only 10 times complicated. We already talked about the risk free, so it's the same things, so I won't repeat myself. But how do I estimate the beta? How do I estimate the risk premium? Okay, so let's go over and try to, to do that. That one I covered before, okay? Let's uh, talk about risk premium. So how am I supposed to, anybody has an idea, by the way, before I show the next slide? Anybody has a, an idea how to estimate the risk premium? Volunteer? Nothing will happen if you be wrong. Don't worry, I won't get any point down. I only add positive if I give a bonus. Uh, Risk-free minus uh, market, return on the market. Exactly. And what is the return on the market? How will you estimate the return on the market? What is the market? Remember from your finance course, theoretically, it's supposed to include all the assets in the world. But that's, you have to be really naive to even say the se sentence like that. In real life, you're going to use the index of S&P 100 or S&P 500. If you want, you can maybe use NASDAQ, but most common using the S&P 100 to reflect the market portfolio, okay? So now I want to take that one minus the risk-free, that's the risk premium. So I will do it every year, I will get a different number. So what I'm going to do, I'm gonna take those numbers and take the average, that's uh, for many years. So you know, the stock exchange was from two, 1928, I, I really didn't update this table, I didn't take to to 2019, but it won't change the numbers for one year, okay? If I go back up to, to, to 1928, up to 2018, and I take for every year the return on the S&P, subtract from it, whatever it was, the T bonds, 10 years, government bonds, take the difference for every year, I will do it for 80 years, and take the average, I'm ending up with 6.38 as the risk premium, that's the average. If I do it for a shorter period, about 50 years, okay, I get 4.24. If I do it only for 10 years, I'm getting almost 6%. And now my questions to you guys, what do you make of it? Is that struggling? I mean, what is the length that I'm gonna do? 
Am I supposed to take it as long as I can? Should I take the last 10 years or should I take last 50 years? Amos, what are the two columns? They both look like they say stock minus T-bills. Yeah, this one, uh, this one, it says T-bonds. Forget about the right side for now. I'll just mention it's later one. Let's just focus on the left one. You're right, I went too fast. The arithmetic average, it means this one is taking the return on S&P 100 minus T-bills. T-bills is less than a year. Okay, but this one usually not being used in real life. This is really what people use in real life. Okay, it's the return on S&P minus 10 years government bonds. I take the difference on the return of both of them every year since 1928 up to 2018. I take the average, I get 6.38. Okay. okay. Okay, that makes that clear. By the way, this is really the most used one. And it means even this one, I don't I still don't really know which one should I use. Should I use this one? Should I use 4.24? Should I use six percent? Almost. You should, you, think? should use the same, you should use the same time frame as risk free and for risk premium. And also I have an idea. Um how about how much the company is willing to pay for insurance? Well, that would be good. That's what we said originally, if you remember. We can use a CD, I mean, CDS, but that would be really hard for estimating stock because we won't have CDS on every stock the, comp the company exists. Almost none of them has that. Okay, very few do, the big one. But here it's really what the theory tells you to do. The theory doesn't tell you how long to the past to go. And in fact, the theory doesn't even tell you how to estimate it. And people in real life, that's what they try to do and then you say, well, even I choose, whatever number I choose, each one of them has such a huge standard error. You see, even going over 80 years, I think it's 80, yeah, 90 years, okay? I got 90 years, I still have a 2.24 standard deviation. That's pretty high, okay? This one for 50 years, I have 2.7. So this is even, okay, the shorter the period would be the higher the standard. You know, if I look only the, te the last 10 years, standard deviation is 8.7. This number is extremely unreliable. I can't even use it, okay? So I'm done with this one. I can say, okay, forget about that because everybody will attack me that this is not a reliable number because I'm using only 10 years and not stable enough. So I say, okay, let's compromise, take those two. I look at those two, they do have high standard deviation, but I said, you know, that's the best I can do. And by the way, in corporate valuation, the best I can do, it's a good answer. Because I don't really know what to use. And I probably would take something in between those two numbers. So I would come with 5.25. I probably can justify it that nobody else can come with a better number. Okay, if nobody can come with a better number, that means I have the right number in that sense. There's no such a thing as a right number in real life, unfortunately. So I think it's quite... Like, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Amos, could you please explain again how we use return on the S&P? I don't think I understand that. So you take the index at the beginning of the year. You look at the index at the end of the year. So from that, you can calculate the return for that year. You take the index in the end of the year, divide by the index at the beginning of the year, subtract one. That's a return for that year. You do it for every year since 1928, the same way, up to 2018. So you got a long line for every year, you got a return of S&P. So far so good? Yes. Good. You do the same things for the government bonds, okay? You do it the same things you do for government bonds 10 years. You have that return for every year, by the way, to calculate the return on the bonds, you have to do two things. You have the, you know, the, the interest, the power interest that you're getting, plus the change in the value of, in the value of the bonds. I won't get into that because you should have known that from finance class. So you take the change in the bonds plus the cash every year, that's your return, okay? You do it for every year, so you have a second column, you take the difference between those two columns, you get 90 numbers as the difference between the two. Now you average it. When you average it, you get 6.38.
Fair enough? Or you want me maybe to show it in a different way? Here we go. Why not? Let's do it this way. See, the way you go about it, you just make two columns. First column, you call it S&P. And then you start from 19, 28. Fair enough? And then you continue, 19, 29, etc. Okay? And you take those one, you drag it up to See what I got, no, I need more. Hey, no, I don't need that much. So I'm gonna delete all of those guys. I need to stop in 2018. So far so good? Yes. So I made one column for the years. Then I do the same things for I, I put another column from key bonds. I should call it even 10 years key bonds. To be clear. Let's call it 10 years key bonds. Okay. Now for every year, I measure what was the return on S&P index and what was the return on the bonds. And then I take the difference. Fair enough? After I take, let's say this year, I'm just making it up, okay? I don't remember, I, I have it probably somewhere. I do have it somewhere. Let's say that was 5%. And that was 1.1%, okay? The difference will be 5 minus 1.1. That will be the risk premium for that specific year. I will do it the same things for every year. So I will get a whole long column of the differences. Fair enough? And what am I supposed to do here? That will be the number, if I do an average on this column, I will get the 6.38. Is that clear? Hello? Yeah, thank you. Okay, good. That's very important. I think it's important to spend the extra few minutes. That's good. Okay, good. So in real life, what people really usually do when you look at those numbers, you say, this one I ignore because it's too, too volatile. The standard deviation is extremely high. So I will take something in between. And 5.25 probably a good number to use. By the way, what the difference between average and geometric? You know, let me open Excel again. How do you calculate geometric? It's a little, you should know that I'm not gonna, I'm probably not gonna ask you what the difference between the two. I don't think I will. If you get two numbers, let's say the number in 1928, you get the index of the difference, let's say even, let's say I get the difference to be some number, okay? Let's say it was, the, the difference in the index was 100, let's start from 100, just for simplicity. And then I go to 2018, it became to be, no, let's take a better number so you won't get confused. I just make it up. That the index was 56. And the index is 2018, it's 2,700. So what is the geometric yearly return? I will take the number in 2018, divide that one by the number in 50 in 1928. This number, it's the return, one plus the return for every year, power 90, because I have 90 years. So what I really need to do, go backward. I'm going to take now power of one over 90, because I have 90 years. Okay, it's like getting now one plus the geometric rate. Okay, okay, if I take now one, I take that number and subtract one, I get the, uh, subtract one, I will get the geometric number. And why that's correct? Let's just re, 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 uh, 
we emphasize the, the calculation. You know, the one plus, if I take one plus the geometrical rate, let's call it RG power 90, that should give me the ratio of the S&P And I will write it in parentheses, a 2018 relative divided by S and P at 2019-28. Okay, so that ratio, it's equal to the geometrical rate power one plus one, power 90 should give me that ratio. So what I did here on the Excel, I just demonstrated, I take the number in 2018, divide by the number in 1928, that's exactly what I have on the right side. I just moved the 90 to the right side, that's why I did power, that's why I did, that's why I did power one over 90, that means I'm taking this 90, move it to the other side. Okay, that means. So is geometric yearly return the same thing as saying geometric average? Correct, that's, that's what it means, geometric average. I just okay. try to explain what it means, okay? And sometimes it's really useful. Uh, so that's really what I just did. Now, if I want to get the RG, I just take the one from the left side, okay? I'll take the one and move it to the right side. That's exactly what I did on the Excel. Okay, that's exactly the way I got to that number. But uh, I just made up those numbers. So I don't really remember what the numbers are. I need to really look it up. But just to explain what geometrical means. Okay. Okay. That's good to know for general knowledge. I think this is very useful. But in real life, really people don't really use, especially for the risk premium. You use just a regular average. So, okay. So the conclusion is we're gonna use 5.25 and I think I even wrote it for a new paper use. And in fact, in this simulation, that's exactly the number I am using. Uh, let me just see why I use that. Here we go, it's 5.25. I didn't really use, I need to use the industry here and it means I will do that. But the 5.25 here is come from our discussion, okay? So if we're going back to the CAPE model, Okay, we know that this one we're gonna use 2%. That's uh, 10 years government bonds. And the ERP, we're gonna use 525 based on historical data. And you know, when you're writing your paper, please do write all those points I'm making the trouble and the problems that we have in these estimations. So when you're writing a paper like that, that means you really do understand the limitation of your estimate. And then in the, in the in about two or three sessions, we will talk about sensitivity analysis and try to see that we are not exposed to error or substantial error when we do those assumptions. And there's other issues that make us feel uncomfortable on picking up this number. It's first, I said there are noisy data, and there are what the lengths that I should use. There's another thing that usually people don't realize when we do a, a calculation of return on S&P, don't forget you always use companies that exist. What does that mean? It means that if company went bankrupt, it doesn't belong to the S&P index. So usually you're getting really a higher return than in real life, because in real life you should have included companies that don't survive. One more time. If I develop an index, and my index always would keep companies, the 100 good companies every year, maybe one of the 100, one year went bankrupt. So what happened in that year, you know, I just add another company, means that in order to really calculate the return, I should really included a negative return of the company that didn't survive. So if I'm every year, and that's what really, unfortunately, it's hard to follow those ones. So people 
kind of forget about this short term, but be aware today. When I'm doing S&P return every year, I'm always keeping only the companies that are successful. Therefore, I'm subject to some bias. That bias called survivorship bias. Meaning, in calculating, I'm always using the top 100, which they survived, and I'm ignoring the one that went bankrupt. And that's kind of fact. It's already that much. I mean, usually the top 100 usually don't go bankrupt. So it's very, quite rare, I would say. So it's not just, it's not a big disaster. So you're not really going to screw up your calculation because of that survivorship bias. But it's good to know. Something like that happened, you might want to consider, especially around 2008, uh, you know, uh, that was a topic, but usually it's not really an issue. Okay, last one, and last part that we need, there's another point beside the last one, but say has to do or not the direct or the conventional uh, campaign. How do I estimate that beta? Anybody has a clue? How do we estimate the beta? Anybody? Go ahead, guys. Any volunteer? How do we estimate the beta? So let's say you want, I'm asking you to do it for Apple. How would you estimate the beta for Apple? You use a sample of comparable firms. No, that's the next, but how did you study it in the, the finance class? What did it taught you in cl a finance class? You should run a regression, remember? You run a regression of the S&P 100 as representative the portfolio, the market portfolio, and you run it on the return of the company you are trying to estimate the beta for. Whatever the slope of that regression, that's your beta. And unfortunately, when you do that, you notice that that beta has a very big variance. Then, you know, if you have a big variance, it means it's an unreliable number. And that's a hard to really justify to use it. And people realize running a regression can cause me to get an estimator that has a big variance and I can't really use it. So with all due respect to the CAPEM methodology, I can't really use it in real life. And then what you just said now, and I liked your answer, that's what we really do in real life. What we do, we take a bunch of companies. It's true that each one of them has a big variance, but the average of them would be a lower one. So we take a bunch of comparable companies. We estimate their beta. By the way, when we're estimating the beta of those companies, okay, we really estimating their leverage beta. So we have to do stage number one. Take the leverage beta, unleverage it, take the average, and then re-leverage. So I will repeat it in a minute by example, okay? So what we do, we do use comparable companies that you should know that, okay? And in a minute, I'm gonna show how to do it. Another method, by the way, I will come back to that one, how to do it in an example. But another method is just do an average of the industry. And in the simulation, okay, I did what I did here, you know, when, uh, let's say, which company is that? Netflix. Netflix, it's operating mostly in the entertainment. So if I use entertainment here, I already give you the beta of that industry. So a good estimate for Netflix, just go ahead and use the beta, the unleveraged beta of Netflix to be like the industry it's in. So that's another method to use. It's a weighted average kind of, of the company similar to Netflix. Now, that's not always the right one to do. Secondly, many companies like 3M, for example, 3M has several industries. When I prepared it before, and I think I destroyed it for someone, yeah, I did destroy it. Uh, I prepared it because they have four. Let's see if I kept, no, I didn't. Okay, by the way, if you look at the annual report of 3M, you will see, you see those numbers, it tells you the percentage. They have four major industries. So they have a consumer business, 15.8, their business is there. If you look at, they have four major, if you look at the north to 3M, they have a, a section of segments and 
each segment, let me go to the very top of that here, operating business segments, and here they give description. The first segment is 36%, okay? So you try to find out here, when you're going to my simulation, try to find that specific industry. I just not gonna look it up. I did and I just jumped before. And I will write here 36 point. That would be a really good paper if you do it that way. Uh, most of the companies, you don't really have that. You have one industry like Netflix, it's enough to use one. You do for Johnson & Johnson, they might have, they have several industries. The major one is pharmaceutical, okay? So if you use pharmaceutical, it won't be too wrong. But for 3M, if you use just one, you'll be mostly likely wrong. This one, I should really look at safety and industry business and choose one that is close as possible. 36.1, that should be the percentage for this one. And I need to really look for consumer uh, goods as close as, I don't think that I found, but I found retail, which is as close as you can get. Those are 46 industries by Pharma and Franchin. They are recommending those ones. And you might find, so you try to find this, I will use retail general, which is the closest that I can get. So now I need to add another industry because they have several of them. And I will continue looking on the next industry, which is here. Um, what is the next one? It's sales and safety in that, and industrial. You will never find that title as a sub industry. So you have to do it the best as you can. So for this one, just try to find another one that is close to this one. I forgot which one I used before. Industrial. Well, if, I think machinery probably would be as close as lost although it's not really reflecting that one because it's business. You have to read carefully and then choose the right one. But the key point is you're doing a weighted average and in this one I will use, what is the percentage here? They gave it to me. Uh, well, let's see, what is this one for this one? Anybody see that? I'm sure there's 36.1. The second one is supposed to be 20, no, this one transportation, 29.9. Let me change that, 29.9. Transportation, there should be one, if I'm not wrong. There is transportation, uh, I think I saw that. Transportation, but there was something close to it. Anyway, I will try to match as close as possible to transportation. I think that's maybe communicate, uh, commu commuting. Okay, the key point is you need to really find an industry as close to that sub industry. By the way, this is what I call AI, uh, this is electronic. It would be really hard to find exactly the one. Here we go, this is air transportation, that's not good. But I think I found one before and I just lost it. Uh, but I think it's clear what I'm trying to do. Uh, let me see, that would be really... Anybody see any industry that's close to transportation? No, I don't really find it. I thought that I saw it before. Uh, I lost it. There's transportation. Yeah, here we go, isn't it? Yeah. Here we go. Okay, that will be the industry that I really need to use for the second one. And I need to add another two, because they have four segments. So I should really have four lines, and each one the percentage I will add. And then it will calculate the weighted average for me. And then I will use that data, okay? That's the better that I'm supposed to use as a weighted average of the rest, okay? That's for, but most of the companies don't really have, uh, they will have maybe one, and most of you will have one. If I go into, as I said before, I go to Netflix, that will be only one entertainment will be good enough. And that will bring the beta, it will take the beta from here and will use it and do the leverage one. It will use the debt over equity for the company and will convert this 0.72 to 1.36. I will repeat it. 
this is unleveraged beta, and I need to take the unleveraged beta and leverage it. How do I do that? You have it in my presentation. You have here this equation. If you have the beta unleveraged, you multiply it by one plus one minus T times D over E. D means death of the company and E the equity of the company. So that's the way you convert unleveraged beta to a leveraged beta. I'm gonna come back to that next session. We're almost done today, but that's really what we will do. Next week we'll continue. But for your paper, it's already done for you, but I do require you to try to explain it. From a weighted average of the beta of the industries the company works in, I take the unleveraged beta and I leverage that. I will repeat it next time, okay? I saw that we got to the end. I don't want to take your time from other classes. Questions, guys? Hello? Anybody? Hello? No, that's clear. Thank you. Good. I will repeat the last part next week, okay? So next week we'll finish the work and we'll start moving to other topics. But I will repeat that stage and I need also to explain how to use a weighted average of several companies. Here in your paper, you only need to use the industry. Thank you guys. Almost. See you next week. If you have Almost. any question, please shoot me an email. I'm available for Thank the next you. few minutes, whoever wants to ask questions. Almost as of now, we only have the, uh, the second assignment due for the paper, right? I think I added another one. And this one, hey, let me go back. I don't really remember. Uh, this, what about this assignment? We did this assignment already. This one, we did, this one you have to submit by the 12. Right, and you said not to do um, long-term ROI. Go ahead, or... go ahead. That's one where you complete it later on. You're absolutely right. right. Okay, so is there a... Then, there is another two. Then when we finish this one, you'll have this assignment. We'll summarize the whole things there. Okay, this is really just calculating the work. And then finally, we do some adjustments. We'll learn some adjustments in the special topics. And then we'll have... Uh, the final assignment will be here. So there is only two more left. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you, guys. And I will upload more questions that will look like uh, questions in the exam. We're getting close, so it's about time. Thank you, guys. Have a good one. Um, also, you're going to upload the questions in a take a test? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Okay, great. I will add to that. I will add to that. Maybe, you know, I'm just thinking about it. it might be a good idea. In parentheses, when I put the questions, a typical exam question or general question, something like that. So you know what to expect in the exam. Some question I write in the take a test to really to teach you more than really testing you. So it's a good way I notice that students like, you know, I give you a lot of examples many times. I say all the answers are correct. The reason I do that because I make you read all the answers, so it's a good way of studying. But for the exam, I usually write it differently. So I will write some question in the, the way I'm going to ask you in the exam. And I will write maybe in parentheses, typical question. I will think about it. That might be a good idea. That would be great. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you. Bye, guys. Have a Bye. Good Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Well, thank you.